Dr. Wayne knows. So if you don't have this book, you're not serious about university learning. This is his latest work, Island of Mines, M-E-M-E-S. Haiti's Unfinished Revolution, Dr. Wayne Miller. And this is one of the symbols of African traditional spirituality from the heart of Africa, from the Congo. So you might have thought it's just an interesting cover with some illustrations. No, this is the deep philosophy of the Congo tradition that links the living with the ancestral realm with the creator. You would have to have my wife come in here to explain it. There was an exhibit on the Congo at the Metropolitan Museum of Natural History. We went there a couple of weeks ago, the last day, and my brilliant wife gave the talk of her life in terms of what all of this means. It's too deep for us even to raise it now. Y'all have to get some schooling before well, I can come back and bring her back, you know, mm -hmm. in, in a month or two. We all got a little bit more with the local Rashid coming and some of the others coming. The Congo, typified in some white boy's book as the heart of darkness. And when he was writing that, he was not writing about the Congolese people. He was writing about the Europeans who exploited the Congo in one of the worst genocides not written about or told about in history. Millions of Africans devastated by one European. That's how deep it is. One European, King Leopold II of Belgium, controlled the richest real estate in the world as large as Europe itself, 80 times larger than his so-called kingdom, Belgium, and he was able to exploit Africans in one of the untold holocausts happening in the 1880s, 90s. They took his country from him, and then they called it the African Free State, and they passed it on to the Belgian government. How could one man get control of a territory 80 times the size of his own kingdom mm -hmm. and as large as Western Europe mm -hmm. and in the land mass it has the richest resources of the human family? Mm -hmm. How could that be? And how could you be sitting here and me and others and not have knowledge of it? We watch it through the street when one of us get killed. And here's a story of millions of us that were killed, uh, their arms were cut off, their hands cut off because they didn't get enough rubber from the rubber trees. So there's a lot that we've got to do. And we can't stop, we can't slow down. And you know, people say, well, Dr. Jay, when is this thing going to stop? It stops when you drop. But it's got to continue. The most significant people on the planet are African peoples, and they have been just given a devastated blow. So they can't function like the most significant people on the planet. And systems are in place to make sure that they don't function like that. These youngsters are born to win, but if the programming in the larger society is to make them losers. Good white folks ain't gonna change that equation. Some wealthy Jews that you might know ain't gonna change it. The only people who could change that to where it should be were born to win, and that means we're winners. We have to deprogram. But how are you gonna deprogram if you don't even know you've been programmed against yourself? People get this little bit of knowledge and they go crazy. Now they have having Hamilton, Armageddon. <laughs> Some Negroes have got a little bit of this knowledge, and they're going to set up a thing where they get thousands. Not just a, a crowd like this. They'll have, a, a, they hope to get a thousand people and get them all excited. This one over here is for the Moors. This one over here is for Kemet, Northern Kemet. This one over here is for Southern Kemet. This one over here is for the Hebrew Israelites. This, 
Insanity. And there's only a few of us left that's going to be able to write the ship. I just celebrated in Ethiopia a couple of weeks ago my 79th birthday. Hey. I'm one of the long distance runners. Like Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, Dr. Asa Haney. Some of us were sprinters. Like Malcolm. By the time he got himself together, he only had about 10 to 12 years. That's a sprint. Some go a little longer than a 100-yard dash, and they go 220. We put King in that category. Both of them were going by the time they was 39. So why has the Creator and the ancestors allowed us to have 50 years of work after King and Malcolm was gone? Dr. Ben made it to 98. Yeah. Chance of Millions made it into his 90s. John Jackson. Some of us have been blessed to be long distance runners. You need that type of time to put the corrective processes in place. So, by way of introduction, let me say that this brother tried to explain it all with his work. And so he said, and write this down somewhere, black people everywhere suffer greatly from a shattered consciousness and a fractured identity. We don't know who we are. We don't know whose we are. But we know we don't want to be African. That's one thing we know. We don't want to be African. You talk to our little children, I ain't got nothing to do with African. Can you see my hair? I just bought it. My mother bought it. Look it. It's flowing down my back. Whoever controls, and that's why they attack him on me, the biggest attack in the history of the world. You all ain't got my history in any of these little statements and whatnot. Why would the biggest attack in the history of the world be thrown at me? Someone who ain't killed nobody? Someone who goes out of his way not to insult people? Why? Because we got into this knowledge. Whoever controls, the images controls the self-esteem. Self-esteem. What do you think about yourself? Whoever controls the images and the knowledge controls the self-respect. How do you respect yourself and others like you, including your family? And if someone can control the self-esteem, and they can control the self-respect, then they have control of the self-development. And because someone controls your self-development, they can program your children from the so-called pipeline from your house, through the classroom, into the street, and onto a jail cell. So they can predict in New York, children who are in the Bronx in the fourth grade, what percentage of them are going into the prisons. The system has said, that's what we need. We live on your blood. And we've done it for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. So when we're talking about the truth and we're talking about African spirituality, you got to go deep. It ain't what you think it is. But I'll tell you one damn thing, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for African spirituality. It's my mother that put that in place. And where is she? I had her here. But she'll come back. I was trying to set up over here, but then they want to get it. Yeah, with this technology, so they all got me off. See, I like the move. <laughs> Let's talk about the rhythm. <laughs> I mean, in the classroom, I'm not getting an affair. You know, people can't just sit there. You got to become involved. And uh, so, you know, but when you're wrapped up, you got a mic over here, you got one over here, you got something hanging around your private parts. And so. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to work with this thing. 
Because <coughs> the most important thing is that you're on the path. You may not know where that path's going to lead you, but if it doesn't lead you to understanding, to some degree, African spirituality, you ain't going nowhere. Because you need African spirituality to deal with this question of shattered consciousness and fractured identity. Other people have put themselves in your mind and your heart. In fact, again, I use the, the triangle shape. I call it pyramid analysis. Mm -hmm. Pyramid analysis. Why? <coughs> to reclaim the pyramids. One of the most significant spiritual institutions in the world. But Dr. Jay, why would you say that? Everybody knows the Jews built the pyramids. <laughs> <laughs> I say they do? What evidence do you have? You'll get some people that will fight you on that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jay, you messing with the holy book. Who's holy book? What holy book? Well, the Bible. So I say, what Bible? Which one are you talking about? There's no such thing as the Bible. If you want to be more accurate, talk about a biblical tradition that spans 4,000 years. You hear what I said? 4,000 years. 4,000 years of a biblical tradition is what you're talking about. And you got a little piece of it. And your piece might be King James. That's the English king who helped to have the Bible be done so his economics, politics, and culture could be manifested and given a religious component. That's A.D. 1600 A.D. is King James. So you can't put that sucker here. This is B.C. and this is A.D. So you put that sucker over here. <laughs> King James, 1600 A.D. But most of us, because we are all raised into the Christian tradition. Anybody here not Christian? Why you're lying? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can see the lion holding his hand to go up there to die and the bridges that got to the court. That little bit of Christianity that we had that allowed us to go through enslavement and whatnot is one of the most important things you need to appreciate. But that, yeah, I ain't had nothing to do with that. Your mama did, your grandmama, your great grandmama did. And here you are in denial. I told you, African people that we were celebrating from a what? Shattered consciousness and fractured identity. If that little bit of Christianity that we had on the slave plantation, if we didn't have it, we might not be here today. Yeah. Yeah. We might not be here today. And I'm telling you that, uh, almost at the point of tears. I'm ready to go with the tears already. I ain't even got into the shit. I mean, I had to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> tell the truth. <laughs> Nineteen seventeen. Nineteen seventeen. Well, what is that, Dr. Jay? You were just playing with all these numbers and whatnot. Well, we can go to nineteen sixteen. Or nineteen fifteen. Or nineteen fourteen. We can go to 1918. That's when some people came up from Georgia when the cotton crop had failed for two or three years in a row. And one of them got to the Goodrich plant, a good year, whatever one of those plants, and then told the people, come on out of Georgia because you can make 30 something dollars a week working in these factories. And so as a result, my people left Georgia and came up to Akron and to Cleveland and to Youngstown, Columbus and Cincinnati. There's a thousand of us. 
And some of us, you know. If anybody knows anything about B&B, &B, mm -hmm. B &B, right. yeah. does that say anything to you? Yeah. Sisters, B&B &B don't say nothing about to you? Yeah, the restaurant. Right? Yeah. 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 Hey, hey, yeah. talk about finances. One of the most important financial family in these United States got going because they knew how to take care of black people's hair. The Bonnerbrothers. The Bonnerbrothers. Somebody said, who? <laughs> One of the things black people learned to do was to take their hair. Madam C.J. Walker taught black folk how to straighten that hair, et cetera, et cetera, and she became one of our first millionaires. Others have followed her in that tradition. Others that are not black have followed in that tradition. Now we're buying hair from Asia. We're going into Korean things, stores to get our toes done. Our women used to do their own toes and their own nails. Now they're in somebody else's shop, they got a gas mask on, and the women are getting their toes and stuff done. So the financial stupidity, the money, hard money that you made now is going for $5,000 Gucci bags, shoes that's going to have your ankles messed up, hair that other people grow specifically to send to you because you want to have the hair that shapes like this. <laughs> this has to do with what we're talking about in terms of consciousness, shattered consciousness, fractured identity. The Ronald Brothers family came up to Akron in 1918. The Jeffreys came up to Akron in 1918. The Maddox came up to Akron in 19. The Shaws, they all came from one little spot in Georgia called Harry George. Near my self. Harry George. And made their way. So now some of them are millionaires. Not only millionaires in the hair business, but when Ebony Magazine didn't put this the right space for their advertising of their hair product, they produced Upscale Magazine. They produced their own magazine. They have parlayed the money that's still coming in from the hair, and two times a year they got the Barber Hair Show. Tens of thousands of people are a part of it. And the matriarch of the Bronner family is Emma Jeffries Bronner. They have followed their millions of dollars in the business world into multi-million dollar church world activities. Three of the sons of the patriarch, Nathaniel, are ministers. One of them, you can go on TV, my wife and my brother's wife, they go on TV to watch that church channel, and at seven o'clock, Bishop Dale Brown is speaking. My sister-in-law told me, you know you ain't supposed to call me at seven o'clock. My wife used to say that too. Until a few months ago, she was watching. I was somewhere else in the house and I heard her talking. I said, my wife's going crazy. She's talking to herself. She was carrying on a big conversation. So I went towards where she was to find out what was going on. And what she was saying was, I have never disagreed with you, but I disagree with you now. And this great young man, a pastor doing the right thing, with a church when I saw him last year in Atlanta at the airport, we just came in for a meeting of ASCAP, one of our associations. He had just come from across the country and we're picking up our bags and we're looking up and here's this tall dude standing over us smiling. That was Bishop Dale Bronner of the Word of Faith Church outside of Atlanta. And so I asked him, how's the church doing? How's all those 17,000 members doing in your church? He said, Dr. J, 
is 23,000 now. You know, when we started to talk, he said, uh, do you know about the Epic Center? And I told him, yes and no, because his mother, when I went down the year before for her birthday, she had mentioned to me about the Epic Center. I didn't know about no damn Epic Center, but as smart as I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to know something about everything, so I act as if I knew a little something. We finally went to church to hear him for the first time in his new church, and then the secretary took us to the other side. It's across the highway from where the church is. $33 million center. State of the art, conferencing, performing, recording, health, all of that. $33 million. And I can't ask any part of that family for a dime. Because in doing it, I'm asking them to refashion your Christianity and grab a hold of Africa. The incident I'll mention to you, and I don't want you to put it on the internet, but you tell Nico something, that's just what they're going to do. <laughs> My wife loved the brother because his message is, is fantastic. But when he said, it's not about Mother Africa, it's about Father God. That's when he separated himself from all that. It's not about Mother Africa, it's about Father God. Why couldn't it be, it's about Mother Africa and Father God? If his father was alive, I'd go right to him and say, no, we've got to change that. It's about Mother Africa and Father God. But I don't have the strength, and I don't want the discomfort of going up to this young man and trying to tell him. If my wife could get to him, that would be another thing. She got the African Holy Ghost. <laughs> See, I'm an African, I the Holy Ghost. You got the Holy Ghost, you know, falling out and dying on. Then that's the African Holy Ghost. And that's when I do something stupid and, and cuss and do things like that, trying to wake you all up. People started looking at me. Reverend Butts, head of Abyssinia Baptist Church, he said, Dr. J, you know you're not supposed to uh, cuss from the pulpit. I said, Reverend Butts, it's not my fault. The African Holy Ghost made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, by way of introduction <laughs> to this heavy thing that I'm going to lay on your asses, on your, <laughs> <laughs> on your mind. <laughs> So I really want to lay it on your mind, but I want you behind the Bible. I don't want your mind to go out and do it after thinking that you're behind sneaking over here trying to be white folks. <laughs> uh, that's the consumers of garbage that white folks produce just for us. Ooh. They produce garbage just for us. You, you are the best thing that ever had nothing to do. They want to get rid of you all. They want to keep you all around as close as possible. And the word got out to the world. That the Negroes of America are the best thing that happened to the human family. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the Arabs around Dearborn, Michigan told the rest of the Arabs, if you want to make some money, come home to black America. They ain't making no demands on the Saudi family to share that oil wealth. They sitting in the desert under a Bedouin tent, trying to figure out how they can get to America and set up a chicken fry in your community. The world knows. Little girls in Asia are told that we're gonna grow this hair of yours. And you know, you're gonna keep it clean and and brush it, it's gonna hang down to your back. And then we're gonna to go to Negroes in America and put that little bit of hair hanging down on your back. We can get a thousand dollars. That's more than your daddy makes the whole year farming. We are actually producing a crop of hair growing Asians that's supplying 
millions, millions and millions of dollars to keep their economies going. And the fantastic thing about hair, that it grows. So you cut it off one year, and then the next thing here, it starts growing back. People are saying, celebrate. Thank God for black people. <laughs> and then we're saying, I wish I could change this black skin. I wish I could lighten it up a little bit, you know. And that's the mind. Whoever controls the mind. Controls on a, on a personal level, controls the behind. But the, that's the personal game that we got to deal with. But the real game that's on the international scene, whoever controls the African mind controls the African mind. Whoever controls the African mind controls the African mind. This is what's being played out on the world stage. This is what's being played out on our personal stage as they keep us from being African. And so we got work to do, but it ain't going to be easy. Can you all see this back there? No, you can't. Sister in the red, what do you see back there? You're just a smarty pants. You can't see it. You're too far away to see it. But you know it's a black medallion. Can anybody else see it? Can you see it, young man? You know, I have a, a great appreciation of you. You wouldn't know why. Um, but when I saw you standing there with your saxophone, I said, wait a minute. This young man has a lot of the Jeffries Foundation. I played in alto and tenor sax for 15 years. Started when I was about nine or 10. Now, who started me? My mother. Now, why should we start me on the playing the sax? Parents knew that you had to become multiply talented. I was an artist already, and she encouraged that. And here she's throwing the saxophone in place when I wanted to be Jackie Robinson. So I had to learn how to manage my life. You know, she said, you can be Jackie Robinson, but before you do, you're going to take care of your younger brother. When he comes from school, you're going to make sure that the house ain't messed up. You're going to keep your little snotty friends from messing up my house. Then you're going to take care of this and take care of that. You're going to do your lessons. And then you can run out and become Jackie Robinson. <laughs> So we had to learn how to manage time. People say to me, hey, how can you do this and that? And go here and go there. I've been doing it all my damn life. And I said to my brother, what is it like to have a, a great big brother? And, and, and what does it mean? He says, well, he's always been great. I've always had to follow him and try to be stepping to greatness. And the big thing he used to say to me, you take care of the world. I'm going to raise me some sons. I'm going to take care of trying to raise him. And you know he did it. Let's go to the videotape. Here it is. There's a reason for my greatness. She carried me in her womb. She didn't drink. She didn't do other things that would have devastated me in her womb. And she gave birth to me on January the 19th, 1937. And her father, who was the idol of her eye, was born on January the 19th, 1888. So I was born on my grandfather's, my mother's father's birthday. But this is her, and where is she? Where is she, sister? See, that's what I told you. You're way there in the back. <laughs> Until I get my little PowerPoint, you know, where is she? Yeah. Heaven is a big place. It's going on almost seven or eight hundred miles. Where, where in Canada? We're talking about spirituality here, y'all. 
Luxor. Luxor. Luxor is the locale of the sacred place of Ashram people that the Arabs gave the name Luxor. The Greeks called it Thebes. The Africans called it Waset. This is the holiest of holies in terms of vibrant temples and spiritual houses. This is the great hall of columns in the Karnak temple complex. Every great African leader, male and female in the Nile, had to contribute something to this great complex. And so there's my mother who was Eastern star, so she was into the Nile Valley culture with her grandsons. One's 12 and one is 14. I was with them two days ago. This one who wanted to be a baseball player and fit in, his ed instructor when he was 10. This one wanted to be a baseball player and an artist when he was eight. There they are at 14 and 12 in the sacred space of African peoples. This was a transformative spiritual happening for them. We did not take a thousand people to the Nile for tourism. Mm. We declared, I declared in the early 60s when I started going to Africa, that it's about pilgrimage. It's about cleansing. It's about understanding your spiritual heritage. The greatest heritage that the world has been given is yours. Everybody else takes a piece of it and then adjusts it to fit their culture. <coughs> Dr. Ben calls it the deification of culture. When the ancient Hebrews came into the Nile, they got a bit of it and then they deified it in what we call the Old Testament. When the early Christians came into the Nile, um, in the time of, of Jesus, which you want to say that that's the beginning of your Christianity, then AD kicks in. And so Jesus is deified. Later, out of the desert, comes the Prophet Muhammad moving between Mecca and Medina, 600 or something AD. And again, this knowledge in his hands becomes deified and becomes a powerful culture. You have to see this flow of spirituality coming from your source. It didn't come out of the desert. It comes out of when people understand the laws of the universe. And you learn the laws of the universe by living along river valleys and having the universe speak to you. We talked about what it was, the rhythm, the heartbeat. Well, the river valleys have that. The river valleys. You along the Nile River Valley. And the heartbeat of the universe is with the Nile. And every season, the Nile overflows its banks. So every season, you've got to get out of the way, otherwise you're brown. So you begin to understand the rhythm of the universe. And you begin to read the universe. So you begin to look up into the heavens. And every season that the Nile is rising, a certain set of stars are in this part of the heaven. And then after a period of time, the Nile overflows its banks, and that certain set of stars are in this part of the heaven. And then after a period of time, when the Nile goes back to its banks, you can plant your crop, and a certain set of stars are in this side of the heaven. And then once you have uh, a period of growth of your crop, then you have your harvest, and a certain set of stars are here. Africans began to relate the rhythm of the universe and the movement of the heavenly bodies to life. And then they extended it, because Africans are very spiritual. They extended it not only to the universe and reading of the heavenly bodies, and they built the greatest culture and civilization as a result of it. So when you're, when you're talking about pyramids and things like that, it's not referencing a great African individual, it's referencing the universe. When you're talking about Africans acknowledging it. These are the three images I used to travel the world with. Pyramids built along the Nile in Giza. But there are also other pyramids built south in the Sudan that are different types, but they're still the same consciousness of linking the human to the divine. And then you have to have sacred places where you transmit the knowledge the spiritual knowledge that you have. 
And you don't have a three-room schoolhouse, or you don't have a tower in Cleveland for uh, Cleveland State. You have a sacred temple. And in your culture, everything is divinely related. So every pillar in your temple speaks to your spirituality. In the great sun court of the great lodge of Marset, there are 44 pillars, each of them representing a moral and ethical principle of the 42 Mahatian admonitions. I have not stolen, I have not lied, I have not defamed the gods, I have not this, I have not that. Those 42 laid the foundation for the 10 that later became significant. So people steal from us, they call it the stolen legacy, and then say we had nothing. And they directly stole from us. The 10 didn't come when they was in, in uh, Ur in Chaldea. The 10 came when they were among the Africans in the Nile. And the Africans have made sure that their tent is not on some tablets. Their tent is built into each pillar of the great court. So the architecture not only speaks to great building, but great philosophical traditions and spiritual understanding. Do you understand where I'm trying to take you? That's a damn shame for me to try because you're not, it's it's a hard, you know, it's a hard road to go. Because I had you in the classroom. See, if I had you in my classroom, I'd beat your ass every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my students run to the class when we get the beating. <laughs> Particularly the Latino students who are black and brown, and they've never been able to, in their culture, adjust to the black and brown. Black and brown is negative. In the Latino culture, which is a very mulatto culture, the idea is to lighten up. Wayne Lowe's talks about that in this book the Malala culture in Haiti, in the Dominican Republic, and he goes into Cuba, and he goes into Brazil. There is a process in the world culture that says, if you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're yellow, you're mellow. And if you're black, get way back. So we have a little ditty around it, but it's been institutionalized into ways that you raise your family, the ways that you conduct yourself, and that's what we have to react to. We have to raise that blackness. But blackness is not a color. You know, here's my little nephews. They are the light shade, but they've been initiated into Africanness. And that's why both of them was on the stage at the law school at Ohio State. One is a congressman spiritually connected to Obama. They were born the same day, August the 4th. But 10 years, nine years difference. Obama was raised coming out of the womb of a white woman and raised by her husband, who's from Indonesia and then raised into manhood by her parents, who were white folks from the Miss West of the United States. Obama may have had an African father. May, because I ain't got to make I got to talk to Trump. Trump <laughs> 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 When Dr. J uses the pyramids, I got a purpose for that. I want to claim the pyramids of Giza. Mm -hmm. um, I specifically teach around the pyramid, because once you claim this, it's yours. So when we're talking pyramids, we're talking about laws of opposites. The Africans understood that. They built their culture around the laws of opposites. And you're talking about systems analysis, so you want the students to understand that. And they don't get it. It's sitting there bamboozled by me. So then you have to bring it down to the genitals. And when you bring it down to the genitals, that's when you got the students. Systems analysis, every system has three major components. The first component of any system is economics. Economics is the first law of the universe. 
Economics is your productive, creative capability. Productive, creative capability. If you're not productive or creative, you die. But economics can't stand alone. Economics has to be properly managed. So economics begets, creates in and of itself politics. Economics and politics are the foundation upon which the world moves and the universe stays its course. Economics is your productive capability. Politics is your administrative and management capability. Everything has to be productive, otherwise it dies. And everything has to be, to be productive and sustain itself, it has to be managed. That's life. That's the first principle you teach young people, that you've got to be productive and creative and not dependent. We teach our children to be dependent. I'm going to do it all right, you're behind, I'm going to do everything for you. We need to make them productive and creative. That's why I was glad to see the brother come in with us this morning and to see him connected to his family, etc. He's been trained, he's been programmed to be productive and creative. Most of us think politics is what politicians do. Politics is what you do to control your administrative and creative capability. So we're talking about systems capability. You can't go nowhere without that understanding. However, your productive capability is real. You need to have that in your control. The management of it, politics, is real. You need to make that work. But none of it will work for you unless there is the aspect of spirituality. And spirituality is not what you do in church or in the mosque or what you do in the African traditional context. Spirituality can be described as culture. Culture. We're not just talking about a Sunday service or a ceremony around our African traditions. Culture is the way one lives. Culture is what one does at the high level. You can have a, a high culture. You can have a, a culture that is uh, mediocre, or you can be at a low culture level. Our people are trained to be at the low culture level. So when we talk it and we sing it and whatnot, our people, hey, the Motown, blow town, just got dick numb, doobie rap, grabbing their genitals and shaking their butt. That's low culture. That's not transmitting of higher values that the Africans taught. In fact, when I raise my hand like this, mm -hmm. this is a sign of the ka. Mm -hmm. This is a sign of linking you, the human, to the divine order of the universe. So even in gestures like this, our culture speaks to that. And our culture is so devastating that it speaks to so many things. Our culture speaks to this. And this is going to get me in trouble. <coughs> now what's that? A what? That's your European mind speaking now. What about your African mind? What does that have to do with Africa? Well, something like that. <laughs> but let's do it like this. What's that? The people who originated the swastika, so-called, are African people. Mm -hmm. Some people in Asia developed it also. Mm -hmm. Native Americans. Mm -hmm. That so-called swastika is a universal symbol. Among the Asians, the swastika turning in one direction is positive and the other direction is negative. Among the Europeans, they didn't even know there was this relationship, so they just took 
one section of it and brought it to Europe and claimed it's the symbol of the Aryans. That's the Nazis. They only got a piece of the action. That's what the Europeans do. They come into our world, Arabs come into our world, get a piece of the action, and don't go out with the whole process. The whole process involves the male and the female principle. This is the male and the female principle. This is the male and the female principle. It involves the balance and harmony in the universe. But when I mention this, they say he's anti-Jewish. When I mention the pyramids, they say, oh, he's anti-Jewish. He's anti-white and this and that. For example, one lesson in African spirituality, there's a pyramid. You play with pyramids every day. You got a dollar in there? Nope. I got one. Well, you wonder, at least means to let you have some money. <laughs> <laughs> That's too much control. <laughs> Good. Anybody right, take out a dollar? This is going to be the first collection. You go into these churches, they take three or four collections. This is going to be the first collection. Dr. Jeffrey is going to give you an analysis, spiritual thing of the dollar bill. Brother, where's your dollar? Oh, they're coming. They're coming. No, you can't. Give him his own damn dollar. <laughs> now, yeah. look. Ain't no need to hold on to those dollars. I'm gonna try to take not only your dollars, your tens and your twenties. <laughs> <laughs> I can't continue this work uh, uh, on, on my salary, my little pension. I'm retired already. <laughs> now, this is the jux of the lecture today. That dollar bill that you have is your legacy and tradition. Stolen and perverted by somebody else. And in place of your value system of spirituality, they put their value system of materiality. So the idea with this pyramid, I always put in circle in the center. That means internal analysis. And then I link the points of the, of the pyramid with another circle. That refers to external analysis. And then I put a yin and yang. That refers to spirituality in relationship to materiality. The European value system has spirit dominating the material. And, and, and the European has the material dominating the spirituality. The African, the Native American, some of the Africanized Asian groups have spirit dominating the material. The perfect example, the greatest material structure in the history of the world is a spiritual structure. Mm -hmm. You hear what I said? The greatest physical structure, two plus million granite blocks stacked on each other. The greatest physical structure you can have some airplanes, you can have 10 airplanes crashing to the structure, they're still going to be there. You had one plane took down one tower in New York, another plane took down another. That's not going to happen with the idea. This building is going to be there forever. And it's spiritually connected. The three great pyramids of Giza were spiritually connected to the stars in Orion's belt. They were not just built to acknowledge some great achievement. They were linking the human spirituality to the divine order of the universe. But Dr. Jay, you gotta be more specific than that. You, you gotta be more clear than that. Well, let's be clear. I'll tell you about the flood of the Nile. Africans reading the universe. And when you're in Africa, you can see the stars because you are near the equator. Africans related economics of the Nile, the economy of the Nile to the overflow. In order for them to master the economy of the Nile, they had to put in place a politics to manage that economics. And so to develop the rulership process, not just a pharaoh, a pharaoh is the ruling house. There's a whole system developed in Af by Africans in the Nile that allowed for the 
politics to manage this enormous economics that was produced by this overflow, which would produce two or three crops. The key to what is going to happen to the economics and politics is the culture. And the African culture is spiritual. European culture emphasizes the material over the spiritual. The African culture emphasizes the opposite. So culture is the transmission of values and beliefs. Mm -hmm. Not shaking your booty. Values and beliefs. And the Africans created a culture, high culture in the Nile, that put at the top of that culture the female principle. Now, I don't want you men to feel bad. Brothers looking good, got his African outfit, got his African knowledge together. And <laughs> my man here, he's shooting all these films and whatnot. And uh, here's our brother, he got his thing together. Look. Don't tell nobody, but we is limited. The female component of the human family is the joint. You're just an accessory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, that's a hard truth for these young men to understand, but it's a reality. So here you say amen. amen. <laughs> Look, men can show how strong they are. And flex their muscles and shit like this, and all that. Develop their bodies. Get their little breastplates together. But that ain't gonna do nothing for nobody but your ego. Mm -hmm. Women have breasts that nourish. Yes, sir. And I don't care what kind of transplant you have, it ain't gonna do the right thing. <laughs> Women can produce in their body life, and they're wired to sustain it for months as the life grows. You can do some transplants, but I don't know if that's going to produce what the Creator and Mother Nature gave to women. You can be nibbling on a man's titties from now until the cow comes home. There ain't gonna, nothing going to come out of that except some titillation. <laughs> And men are productive. <laughs> we produce sweat, tears, snot, spit, piss, and shit. But we don't produce life. We don't sustain life. Now, we got to face reality. We need a reality check. You can't have a woman five steps, ten steps behind. You better have her right out there so you can see where she's doing and what she's going to do. And if, if, if she's in great danger, you need to be there. Not you stepping up and she's in the back. you got to be there because you may have to go into action immediately to protect her. Hey, boom, boom! You may have to move that shit out of the way. <laughs> but we done got caught up into a little cultural thing there. African men. Instead of showing their prowess as the warrior principle, are showing the world their behinds and not their minds. Black men are so proud. All around the world, I've been everywhere. The Caribbean, Brazil, I've been in Africa. Europe, black men have mastered the act of showing the world 